Well, let me ask you a question this morning. You want me to preach or not? Got something burning in my heart. Got a bell ringing in my soul. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, open them with me, please. Second Chronicles chapter 15. Reading with me, please, beginning at verse number one. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found with you. But number three, if you forsake him, he will forsake you. The greatest lie being perpetrated on the body of Christ in our generation and in subsequent generations is the lie out of the pit of hell and we'll just start off running this morning. I don't have time to dance with your sister. Is the diabolical lie called eternal security that once you got it, you can't lose it. Hey, what did the Bible say? It said the Lord is with you while you're with him. It said if you seek him, he'll be found with you. And it says if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, it did not say he would forsake you. It said if you forsake him, he will forsake you. God's not going to hang around just because he loves you. You got to love him back. God's not going to serve you just because he wants to serve you. You got to serve him back. God's not going to bring his presence to you if you're not willing to bring your presence to him. God's not going to bring his finances to you until you surrender yours to him. God's not going to give you his life until you give him your life. And that's a lie to believe you can live any way you want to and it won't make any difference. This book still says the soul that sinneth, it shall die and the wages of sin is death and it pays no smaller dividend. Well, that's old covenant, Brother Rob. Well, let's get over into the new. Let's took, turn to the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's see what he had to say about it. Chapter three, please, of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everybody's still turning. Hallelujah. This is better than butter beans. <laughs> Chapter number three, verse number five. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Everybody shout, that's me. Yes. Shout, I'm an overcomer. Now watch this. You don't need to be an overcomer if you've already won this thing full square. What would you have to overcome? We got some obstacles on this gospel road. We got some temptations lurking behind that tree. Some buggy eyes sticking out of them bushes over there. We got some quicksand to avoid. The word called it the miry places. 
in Ezekiel, that wheel in the middle of the wheel got turning. And Ezekiel said, avoid the miry places. Stay away from the quicksand. Watch out for the avalanche. You got to watch out for those that are ready to ambush you and take what you've got. The Bible said, fight to make your election sure. Fight, let no man steal your crown. My God, I should have saved this one. <laughs> Let no man take your crown. Fight the good fight of faith. Keep your eyes fixed on the prize of the whole high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Don't let anybody get you caught in the quicksand of the rudiments of regimented religion. Don't let anybody sidetrack you. Stay in the middle of the road. There's heaven to gain at the end of this highway. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now wouldn't it stand to reason if there were those who he would not blot out. Seem like there might be some folk once having tasted of the cup of Christ, once having walked with the Lord of the lampstands and the Christ of the candlesticks, once having felt the holy Shekinah presence of the glory of God, once having shunned the wrong and done the right, once walking hand in hand with the crucified Christ, once having their head bent in holiness and purity, the cleansing blood of Christ touching them at the top of their head and eradicating their sin, those having begun to plow, but the Bible said, woe unto him that putteth his hand to the plow and looketh back, for he is not fit for the kingdom of God. A lot of folk need to hear this today, not here today. We're going to see some amazing testimonials from a hog pen, Hall of Famer. Turn your Bible quickly to Luke's Gospel. The Gospel according to St. Luke. We'll begin reading in the 15th chapter. 15th chapter of the gospel of Luke Isaiah said seek him while he may be found and call unto him while he is near sounds to me like a time may come when you will seek him and cannot find him there may come a time when you will call and he is not near I'm going to get letters on this one. Are you in chapter number 15? We have in chapter 15 the story of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. All of them pointing to the same thing. It is actually not the story of the prodigal son. It is actually the story of the pharisaical older brother left at home. For Jesus begins his discourse speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. And his whole intent, his whole passion, his whole message, his whole proclamation is this one thing. God reaching out to a hurting, lost, lonely, desperate, depraved, dying, diseased, and destitute horde of humanity with grace, with mercy, and with forgiveness. He begins the discourse in chapter 15, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. <laughs> hey, I'd like to shout there a while. You ain't ready for this this morning, I'm telling you. I'm just going to hold some of it back. Come on, preacher. I want to tell all you political preachers something. I want to tell all you folks with your dignity, your pride, your haughtiness, your puffed up spirit. I want to tell some that try to get people wonder why nobody gets saved in their church. Because you become an ecumenical boys club. Because you become an adoption agency adopting other people from other people's churches rather than becoming a delivery room and birthing souls out of the pit of hell into the kingdom of God. I want to make an announcement today. I want somebody to shout with me, the God I serve receive us sinners. I thought after I preached on Sunday night, Lord, I got awful mad. He said, that's all right, I got mad too. He said, it's all right as long as you got mad at the right crowd. And he didn't get mad at the prostitutes. He didn't get mad at the alcoholics. He didn't get mad at the lepers. But brother, when he started dealing with that pharisaical, Sadducee, leaven of Herod, leaven of Corinth, leaven of Galatia bunch. He looked them square in the eye and said, you bunch of vipers, you venomous snakes. He went into the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers. I believe the heart of God is still the same today as it was in Luke's gospel, chapter 15. I believe it's time we recognize we're still serving a Christ who is bent on on finding the lost coin, finding the lost sheep, leaving the 90 and nine, and finding the one that's gone wayward, he's still looking for the prodigal son. Psalm 146 records these words, refuge forsook me, and no man cared for my soul. We got a bunch in Christianity today that have no earthly idea what the Great Commission even is, much less to begin to fulfill it. We are not called to the upper crust. We are not called to create some ecumenical community. We are not called to big, build a big church uptown with a steeple so high it reaches to the sky. We are not called for new programs. We are not called to get seminary smarties have palatable preachers in our pulpits that will tickle the ears of the people and gain a big crowd. Some of you that have been trying to gain a big crowd, you better stop it. God didn't call you to gain a big crowd. One time Jesus preached and everybody there got up and walked out on him. I want to know what it's like when the pharisaical crowd gets up and walks out because as soon as they walk out, they give room in the pew for an old, dirty, rotten, stinking, sin, sin-filled sinner that wants to find find his way to the cross. Amazing testimonials from a hog pen hall of famer. Begin reading with me please at verse number 11 and he said, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said unto his father, father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth unto me, and he divided unto him his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself unto a citizen of that country. And he sent unto him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. When he came to himself, he said, 
How many hired servants in, you know, something just spoke to me out of that verse. When he said, he said, who was he talking to? And nobody there but a bunch of pigs. I doubt that he's carrying on a conversation with the hogs. I think the boy started talking to himself. I think maybe it's time we started talking to ourselves. I think maybe it's time some of us started looking around seeing where we're living, what we're eating, who we're fellowshipping with. The old timers used to say, show me who you run with and I'll show you who you are. They said if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, chances are pretty good it's a duck. He started talking to himself and he said, and he came to himself, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. And he arose, came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Hallelujah. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Are you ready? If you're taking notes, lesson number one, amazing fact number one from a hog pen hall of famer, this man desired the father's possessions, but he refused the father's presence. We got a crowd walking on the face of the earth today. The only reason they're sitting in padded pews underneath crystal chandeliers is because somebody told them they were gonna get something for it. Some preacher that refused to tell them they were a sinner said just come the way you are. God will take you like you are and add righteousness unto you. Let me tell you something. You can't fill a ditch until there's a ditch dug to be filled. You can't receive righteousness until first you recognize you're a sinner. In order for God to put something in you, there's got to be room made for it and that means something that's already there has got to come out. I like what Oral Roberts said, God comes to take out of you, take off of you everything the devil put on and put back on you everything that the devil took off. Hey, I'm tired of this crowd that wants to run around like they're in some kind of Amway meeting, just run down here to the front uh, confess Jesus Christ uh, just shine on the dotted line just shake the preacher's hand and before you know it posies are going to pop up on your primrose path before you know it you're never going to have a care you're never going to have a struggle God's going to bless your business going to bless your kids and they come down like they're joining some business organization let me tell you something friend this is not a business organization this is the kingdom of almighty God and there's only one way in that's the blood route the Calvary route the repentance route the confession route the dying route if you want to live you got to learn to die I'm just stirred up this morning In the 106th Psalm David said the children of Israel cried out, made their request to God. God granted them their requests, but sent leanness into their souls. We've never had a church with such nice dresses. We've never had a church with such pretty suits. We've never had a church that was prospered more in the kingdom of God. We've never had more money than we've got in the church today. 
We've never had more people walking in health. We've never had more people seemingly walking in power. But I'm just wondering why the church corporately having all those things is getting less done today for the cross of Christ than at any time in history per proportion. We are losing ground every day of our life. It takes 300 churches, three years, to have one person born again into the kingdom of God in their services. These are proven statistics. Only 18% of the body of Christ is tithing. I'll tell you what I've, we've done. We've went to the heavenlies. We've bombarded the heavenlies. We've told God. We've taken our little wish list. We've lined it out to God. Then we've stacked God's covenant word up beside it and said, your word said if I would do thus and so you do thus and so now I demand you little spoiled brat you have you ever seen a little spoiled brat look at them some of them got a face make Castro ashamed some of you looking at me this morning like a reject from a witch factory is anybody listening to this preacher am I preaching right yet God's a covenant God and he will not break covenant you can take this book and if you learn to use the right verses, God is bound to his covenant and he will begin to do those things in your life. Now, doesn't mean he wanted to. Doesn't mean it was his plan for you. In fact, it may wreck ruin and havoc in your life. My God, I'm wanting to preach this morning. But we take our little wish list up to God I want a new house. New house, new house. I confess, I have a new house, new house, new house. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a new house. Now, I didn't say that. Just saying we got things all crossed up. If you want to follow the Christ example, find yourself a garden of Gethsemane. Open up to the book of Romans chapter 8 and you'll find out we don't know what we have need of. We don't even know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Brother, get yourself a Gethsemane and say, God, I don't, I'm not interested in your possessions. I want your presence. Find yourself a place and say, not my will. I told you I wasn't gonna drag you along this morning. Find you a place and say, not my will, but thine be done. I'll go where you want me to go. Say what you want me to say. Do what you want me to do. And if they brand me a heretic and everybody on earth refuses to go with me, still I will follow. Lead on, O King Eternal. Lead on through famine. Lead on through prosperity. Lead on, lead on. But wherever you lead, I'm gonna put my feet in the footprints of your big feet. I'm not stepping out of line. I got my hand in the master's hand. Hey, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. It's time we stop going to God with our order and telling God how to order our steps. God said, I'll order your steps aright and I'll make your feet like hinds feet. I'll keep you from falling. We're doing a whole lot of falling because the wrong one in the covenant ordering the steps. We've taken the word and become God's manipulators rather than going to the mountain and coming down bearing God's mark. Some folks say, I touched God. Hey, I'm not nearly as interested in touching God as that he reaches down his nail-pierced head and touches me.
what God's got. We want his possessions. Give me what's mine. And you're right, it belongs to you. I want it now. But you're not ready. Now, I want it now. I want it now. I have a three-year-old, I'm qualified. That's the way we act. I want it now. It's mine. Now, Father says, I thought you wanted me. I thought you wanted me. No, we don't want you. We want what some slick-haired, shiny-shoed shyster told us you'd give us. We're not interested in dying. We want to live. And the television set, the world told us what life was, and we take the Bible and demand God to give it to us. Sometimes, Willie, we know not what we have need of. Sometimes we don't know what we're praying for. Let me tell you something this morning. God has nothing to give you. Nothing. That's double zero. He has nothing. Nothing to give you. And until you recognize that, you will never find the true riches of this kingdom. God does not have existence to give you. God is existence. He doesn't have healing to give you. He is healing. He is it. He is the... He's its, he's its substance. You get him, you got it. Hey, I like the way you're shouting now. Until you discern that Jesus Christ of Nazareth must become the totality of the answer to every prayer you pray, you are praying a bastard prayer. You are praying a prostituting prayer. You are prostituting the kingdom of God for your own fleshly, lustful gain. And I'm here to announce today it's time it's stopped. It's time we stop seeking the creatures and the things of the creation. And we begin to seek the creator. That's what God said in the book of Romans. You serve the creature. You're serving the creature. You're serving yourselves and not the creator. Let me tell you this morning. Let let me make this announcement. Let me plead with you to understand that you are not here. God is not here for your pleasure. We've got this thing backwards. You are here for his pleasure. Oh, go ahead and patty cake if you want. Ninety-nine percent of our prayer life is nothing more than God give me. Jesus, this is Jimmy. Tell me what 
you gonna give me? How about telling him what you're gonna give him? You stop praying that prayer after you got born again. When you got down to the altar, you were gonna go to Africa, remember? You were gonna go to India. You were gonna go to the four flung corners of the world. You were gonna give God anything. You'd do anything. God, I'll go to church 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but you can't make it to midweek service a year later. You forgot what you said down there, and now the only thing you know to tell God is you need a new suit, and you need some more money in your bank account, and you need this, and you need that, and you need something else. Instead of crying, where is the Lord? God of Elijah's I of Elijah I hear God cry where are my Elijah's who is the one coming to me and saying God here I am I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all I, I, we're like this little spoiled brat prodigal son running to the father Jesus this is Jimmy give me what belongs to me I don't want to live in your house my God sin will make a fool of you Number two. The prodigal son was amazed how easy it is to leave home. Father didn't beg him to stay. Nobody followed him down the road saying, but won't you come back to church? They didn't hire staff people with good tithe dollars to go out and try to drag so-called Christians. Hey, I like the way you're shouting now. Am I preaching right yet? To go out and drag them back into church, bless their little puny gizzards, Somebody stepped on their toes. Well, if they'd have had their feet shod with the preparation of peace, it wouldn't have made any difference. Well, somebody hurt my feelings. Well, if they'd quit living by feelings and realize that book said to just live by faith, they wouldn't have anything to worry about. Let me tell you something. It's easy to leave the Father's house. All you gotta do is will to do it. I can go commit whoredom tonight with the best of them. I can be drunk by two o'clock this afternoon. Are you listening? And God will divide unto me that what belongs to me and let me go. God is not going to make you serve him. This boy didn't backslide in the hog pen. He backslid in Sunday morning service. Shout now. I said he backslid in Sunday morning service. He started getting cold in his heart. He started getting complacent. He started getting selfish. He started caring only for the Father's possessions but couldn't stand the presence of the Father. Listen, I know preachers that love the crowds and hate the people. And I want to make another statement right now. While it's easy to leave the Father's house, you can't be driven out. Sometime when I got an amen corner, this thing will preach, I guarantee you. My time's getting away from me. You can leave any time you want to. Get up, puff up like a toad. Say, why is everybody always picking on me? They stepped on my toes. They hurt my feelings. I'm taking what's mine and I'm leaving. 
And all the while, you're looking over your shoulder. You're like a little kid running away from home. You packed up your little duffel bag, and all the way down the driveway, you're looking back, wondering why mama's not running out there to stop you. Let me tell you something. Grow up, big boy. Grow up, big boy. You want to leave this church? I'm not coming knocking on your door. Just go right ahead and leave. You want to get out of the presence of God? Just go right ahead. Just get out of the presence of God. If that's what you want to do, just go ahead. Get out. I'm coming back here because I want to talk to you. Some of you sitting at home today, you weren't in church today. You weren't in church last Sunday because somebody hurt your feelings. Let me tell you something. The only person God's sending your way between you and a backslider's hell is me. And I'm standing and in your face today and I'm telling you get back to church shake yourself get back into the father's house straighten yourself up grow up shake off the cares of this world get back into the father's house there's plenty there's provision there's power prosperity peace in the father's house get back run back as fast as you can run Make it hot on them, God. Make it hot on every cold heart. Every person in this building today, some of you already been to your room. You already packed your stuff up. You've already made the determination to leave the Father's house. Let me plead with you. Let me plead with you. Don't walk out the door and look over your shoulder and wonder where everybody is supposed to try to keep you in. It's all right, hit the altar, brother. Hit the altar. There ought to be about 200 more already joined you. We're backsliding. We say we're sick, God says you sin. We say we're weak, God says you're wicked. Adultery is no longer sin in Hollywood. And welfare makes illegitimacy legitimate. Are you listening to me today? It's time we said we're in the, hey, what happens to a man? What gets a hold of a man? I don't understand how having once tasted the things of God, you can be satisfied with the filth of this world. I don't understand that. Well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, at least they're trying. The world ain't even trying. Is this good in the Bahamas? I got more of this, you know. What would possess a man to leave the father's house? What would make our teenagers who have tasted of the things of God, go out and smoke a marijuana joint. What would make a choir member in the presence of God in the Father's house run out and commit adultery and fornication? What happens to a man Make him sell out. There's only one thing. The devil. I'm going to continue now. You can leave the father's house, but you cannot be driven out. Who are we going to blame? Talk to me. Who are we going to blame? Well, it was the devil. No, wait just a minute now. Oh, wait just a minute. Greater is he that is in you 
than he that is in this world. Same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead now lives on the inside of you. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and make our feet like hinds feet. That book says, I believe in the 10th chapter of Mark's gospel or Matthew's gospel, I don't know everything, just some things. Anyway, it does say no man. That hand up there, stand up. He said you are engraven in the palm of my hand. He said no man can pluck you out of my hand. God's got a grip that will not be shaken. You gotta turn around to the Father and say, let me go. That lie of eternal security been around since Genesis 3. Hath God said, you shall surely die? You shall not die. That's what he says today. Only now he preaches it from pulpits. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You shall not surely die. Wait! You got a defective Bible. Send that thing back wherever you bought it. Because this book says in Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sinneth shall die. Didn't say anything about whether it had ever known Christ or not. Just said the soul that sins will die. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And that's the wage of sin paid before you knew him. And it's the same wage sin pays after you have lived in the Father's house. My God, this is good. Who can we blame? James chapter one. Let no man say when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. For God tempteth no man with evil. Let me tell you what 2 Corinthians said. That with every temptation, God will make for you a way of escape. Brother, there's an exit door out of every situation that the devil tries to tempt you with. And if you want to walk out the door, don't turn around and say, the devil pushed me. The devil doesn't have the ability to push you. If you left the father's house, you made the decision. You opened the door. You packed your clothes. You were tempted because you were drawn away of your own lust and enticed. That word enticed, It's the same word we use about prostitutes. It means solicited or asked to do business with. Satan's only power is to suggest to you that you deal at his store. Flip Wilson told a lie when he said the devil made me do it. You made you do it. You made you do it, sir. When you got to flirting around with that little flippy 
skirted thing at work. You did it. You got drawn away. You got tempted. It was you, sir, standing in that airport looking through that pornography after you just kissed your babies goodbye two hours earlier. You got tempted. You got drawn away. You got suggested. The devil made the suggestion. And instead of you saying your soul was not for sale, you sold your soul to the devil, sir. But I've got good news for you today. Hosea says he is forever married to the backslider. There's a way back to the father's house. My God, this is good. I ain't got time to finish it. Right now is where I got to determine this is a two-parter or we're a one-parter. Oh. Well, if you believe I'm shouting right, preaching right, shout now. Some of them wish I'd hurry. Put them out of their misery. Getting hot in here. Uncomfortable. Palms are sweating. Hearts are palpitating. Nerves are getting frazzled. Hey, I must be telling, hey, 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 welcome to World Harvest Church, and this is your life. Nobody can make me leave. I don't care what you do to me. You can't talk about me enough to make me leave. You can't laugh at me enough. Take my houses, take my lands, fly your helicopters over my house, print your lies, put your lawsuits, do whatever you want to do. Laugh at me when I walk down the street. Whisper about me in the hotel. Talk about me in the restaurant. Talk about my kids. Do anything you want to do. Take my preaching license. I don't care what you do. I don't care what the devil does, brother. I'm engraved in the palm of his hand. And I'm telling the Father, hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me. Don't let me go. Hold me, hold me, hold me. Some of you used to shout, but your shout's gone out. Some of you used to praise, but now you're in a haze. Come on now. Don't worry about him. Worry about if you shouldn't have followed him. Don't think about him. Think about God pricked your heart 15 minutes ago to hit this altar, and you ain't hit it yet. Come on now. Come on now. I feel the power now. Hey. Hey, hey, you're on the driveway going from the Father's house. Stop. You don't have to hit the hog pen. Number three. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Where the dearest and best 
for a world of lost sinners was slain. Listen. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Let me tell you something. Hold on, brother. Hold on, sister. Cling to the cross. Stay in every church service you can get in. There's a storm coming. I used to play football and sandlot football across the street from my house in a vacant lot. And we'd stay out there. We didn't, we were oblivious to everything except it was third down and one. And I can hear my mama opening up that old screen door, standing out on that porch, hollering, Rodney, get in, get in. Get in the house. There's a storm coming. Let me tell you something. There's a storm coming. A satanic assault is loosed against the body of Christ such as this planet has never experienced. God's gonna shake everything that can be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken will remain. This is no time to be in by a shoestring, brother. This is a time to nail your feet down to the floor, shut the windows to the world, lock the door to the devil, put out a sign, no vacancy. Let it flash on the other side. The storm's coming. The storm's coming. This is a time to get in the Father's house. I'm going to give you this one. I'm going to quit. That boy found out it's a short honeymoon. Wasn't long till the fat lady had done some. And the party's over. Wasn't long till all those friends standing out at the fence saying, Come on, come on. Come on, come on. What are you doing in there with that bunch of deadbeats? Come on. Wasn't long down that road till they looked around and they're all gone. You listening to me? Where, where does the bum go when he gets down and out? To the friends that encouraged him to leave home? No, they've already gone. He goes to the church. Let me plead with you young people. Don't believe the lie of the devil feel sorry for Hollywood feel sorry for Nashville singers feel sorry for rock and rollers wheeling around incantations to the devil chewing heads off bats and them sitting by telling you you've been left out that's a second lie of the devil you've been left out the devil will promise you the rainbow and he'll deliver the rain how insane a man begins to act when he gets away from the Father's presence. What a fool sin will make out of you. It'll leave you on the wreck of AIDS. It'll leave you with a little baby and you a baby yourself. The devil will fiddle your music to get you out of the house, out of the father's house, and then he'll take the fiddle and beat your brains out with it once you get away from the father. Don't go back. Some of you have started. You're already at the screen door. You got your little duffel bag thrown over your back. You're leaving the Father's house. This 
is your moment. Your moment of destiny. This is the last voice you'll hear. The next voice you hear. It's all right, honey. Get all of it you want. The next voice you'll hear will be the grunting of the hogs in the slime pit of this world. There are people in this church that took their vacation during camp meeting and went and played around on the river. You backslid, sir. You're cold in heart. Well, I'm having trouble. You're backslid. No wonder you're having trouble. No wonder you're out of the Father's house. There's no covering. There's no protection. My God, the storm's rising. Run back, run back. Get back to the Father's house. <laughs>